Welcome to a video on an assignment to draw a hyperbolic paraboloid using one of the following options. Multi-frame. For those of you who managed to get that uploaded on your computer and who feel comfortable working with that software. Some other computerized drawing program, which could be Rhino, AutoCAD, or a host of other things that I may not be familiar with, but you might be. Or finally, a piece of paper with two R triangles, a scale, and pens or pencils. I don't know that any of you were taught this trick, but sliding two triangles by each other allows you to draw parallel lines, which is a pretty important thing in this particular assignment, but in fact, uh, for drawing in general. The classic challenge with drawing on paper is choosing the correct projection so that you see everything that you need to draw without some part of what you're drawing obscuring some other part. I think watching this video should help you make the right decision, but as you watch, if all you have is paper and pencils and triangles and a scale, then you'll want to be thinking carefully about how you're going to lay out your drawing before you start. This used to be our classic dilemma as architects was always figuring out beforehand exactly what angle and exactly what method we wanted to do use to draw something in three dimensions. But I'm proposing you draw something in axonometric and we'll talk about that as we go through this video. I'm going to use Multiframe because that's a program that I'm generally comfortable with and I don't happen to have with me either a scale or two triangles. So my standard method of drawing will be Multiframe. Many of you will have other programs that you will be very comfortable using and you should feel free doing that. So I'm in multi-frame and I'm going to draw a line and I'm going to go edit that line. And I'm going to do a few things here that may not be immediately obvious to you, but as I progress through this, it will make more sense to you. I'm going to take this end right here and I'm going to double click on it and I'm going to set X equal to 50, uh, Z equal to 50 and y equal to zero. y is the vertical dimension. And then I'm going to take the other end of this and I'm going to set x equal to 50, z equal to minus 50, and y equal to zero again. And now I'm going to zoom out and I have this member right here, which is 50 feet out in the X direction, and it goes from minus 50Z to plus 50Z. Then I'm going to duplicate that. So I click duplicate. I'm going to do it cylindrically. I've been through this exercise just now, so you see already how a bunch of things are already set but I'm going to rotate it through 90 degrees each time. I'm going to duplicate it three times. So when I click there, I now have a square. Now, my square looks like a parallelogram, and I'm going to kind of rotate it around to an orientation that looks comfortable to me, right there, for example. So in your hand drawing, you can draw a parallelogram also. What I recommend is that you make this member and that member equal to each other and that you also make them some nice um, integer number of some kind of dimension. So if you've got a big piece of paper, you might make each one of these sides 10 inches. Um, or you, if you don't have a big piece of paper, you might make them 10 centimeters but I'd try not to make this drawing too small 
because that's going to be irritating to draw carefully. So I have this parallelogram and just to make it look a little more like what you might be drawing, I'm going to put it in that orientation right there. Now I'm going to take two points here. And, and by the way, each one of these members, just to make sure you get what's going on here, they're a length of 100 feet. I chose 100 feet because I want a nice round number, and I want to be able to do everything in this process um, in terms of integer numbers of some sort. So I have that. That runs from this point, which is plus 50 for both X and Z. So remember in multi-frame, X and Z are in the horizontal plane, and Y is the vertical dimension. So now I'm going to take this and I'm going to pick two points on the opposite sides and I'm going to come up to geometry and I'm going to extrude them 30 feet up. So you'll notice I've already been through this exercise just to make sure I know what's going on. And I click that and I end up with that, those two vertical members. Now I'm going to take this tool and draw some lines. So I'm going to go from the high point down to the low point, back to a high point, down to the low point, and back up again. Now, in my case, I want to give some color to things, and I suggest you do that also. So it'll be really nice if you're using pens, if you have a red pen and a black pen and a green pen, because that will help reinforce certain issues that I would like for you to be able to visualize. But in my case, I'm going to take these members right here and I'm going to go give them a section. And for the moment, I'm going to just go pick pipe and I'm going to make them three. And the only reason, main, the main reason I'm doing that is just to give them a color. So now they're green and they're distinguished from everything else. And those members, by the way, in terms of this drawing exercise, have already served their purpose. So we're not going to be manipulating them very much, but they do help provide us with a frame of reference. So these members are the vertical offsets, this member and that one. And this represents, these members, represent the square in the horizontal plane. So we want to remember all that, but again, we don't have to manipulate those very much. Now I'm going to come along here and in this program, I'm going to give these members some other dimension. And by the way, I can also give them a name or something like that. So for example, I might want to go to member labels and say those are edge members. But for right now, the important thing is that I go to the sections library and I pick something pretty substantial for those edges. And even now, what I just picked, which was a five inch pipe and the inside is five inches in diameter, um, that's not a very significant member in the context of a structure that's spanning 100 feet. But it at least acknowledges that those edge members are going to be more important than certain other members. Now I'm going to go select all those. So I'm going to come here and say sections. And now it selects all those members that I've assigned that section. And I'm going to go up to geometry uh, and pick subdivide member. And I'm going to subdivide it into 10 parts. So when you're doing your drawing, you'd like to make these edge members something that's easily subdivided. But now that I think about this in these drawings, these members are not going to be the same length. So you're going to have to figure out some way to subdivide those edges 
into 10 equal parts. So now I've got the boundary definition for a hyperbolic paraboloid, and we're going to use something we call the mathematical directrices to define what the geometry of this surface is. So I'm going to do the following, and I apologize, but I'm working in multi-frame, and I'm going to use some shortcuts that I have in multi-frame that I'm familiar with. So here is the tool that allows me to do multiple members. So I'm going to come snap to that point, go to this point, go back, and I'm going to zigzag across. And then in a moment, I'm going to explain to you that some of these members I'm keeping and some I'm not. So it turns out to be easier to just draw some extra members here. Those of you who are drawing this by hand will not draw all these members. And I'll show you in just a second what you will draw. And I'm going to just stop there. And these members right here are the ones I don't care about. They were just sort of extra stuff that got generated in this process. And I end up with that. So what you're doing is if you're drawing by hand, you're going to take a member like this and you're going to draw across there. Now, so I'm going to take all of these and I'm going to assign them a section also, which is something little P1. And I'm only doing that in this case just to give it color so that I can make distinctions here. But I also could give, the, give these a name. So if I look in plan, so I go to the plan view and I hit control total, I see all those members in the plan projection are in the Z direction. So I could also come and give them labels and say there are directrices parallel to Z. I'm not really going to use that right now, though. Um, but I just want to sort of make that point that there are ways you can label things in a program like this that allows you to go back and select them later in some systematic way. And learning to think about these things in advance, it's kind of hard to do it when you're just learning a program to begin with, but the more you master those kinds of skills, the better off you're going to be in terms of being able to control and manipulate what's happening in your software. So now I'm going to go up here and I'm going to pick geometry and I'm going to pick subdivide member and I'm going to type in 10 subdivisions like so. Now, one of the things that we can do in multi-frame is we can come along and we can put a member in the opposite direction and then we can break that also into 10 parts. And now something interesting happens. If I look at a joint right here, it says joint 115. So when I click on this member right here, I see that joint 115 is one of the joints in that subdivided member. And then when I go click on this one, it also tells me a joint 115 is a joint in that subdivided member, which means these two members within multi-frame are legitimately connected together at joint 115. So that's a nice thing because then it doesn't require that I snap from there to there to there to there and so forth. So it's a nice, uh, lazy way of generating this grid 
And for the moment, I'm going to just go through here and draw a few like this. And then I'm going to do my lazy man thing again that I did before. I'm going to put in multiple members. And then I'll go back and erase the ones I don't want. It's just a slightly quicker way to draw things because I don't have to keep going up and selecting that tool over and over again. Okay, so now I'm going to get rid of the members that I don't want. And now I have all the mathematical directrices. They're all straight lines. They're all well behaved. They're all intersecting and they are producing this particular structure. So now I can start drawing the actual structural parts because remember straight members don't work well in, stru uh, in their structural behavior. And, um, we got a bunch of straight members here that are not going to be very structural. We want to get the curve members and we get them by working off of the directrices. This is why they're called directrices because they direct us about where to go in creating the geometry of the structure. So I'm going to go here and I'm going to connect that point to that one, to that one that one and so forth. Now if you're drawing um, by hand you need to continue that whole process. If you're working in software like multi-frame you don't have to draw all that because we're going to spin this model around and do some mirrors and it's all smoke and mirrors. And we're going to create this drawing by using the symmetry. And by the way, let me, before I go too far here, let me pick all these members. Ooh. So I got a whole bunch of those members that I never assigned a section to. So I want to go do that now because they're all supposed to be P1. So watch me carefully here and make sure I'm doing this correctly. I'm going to go pick P1. And now I can say something like, I can go up and say Analyze Linear, and it picks the members that haven't been sized yet. So I can go in and I can say, okay, let's make all of those P2. And right now I'm just picking a section to give them color, but you're going to give all this color in your drawing. So those of you who are doing a hand drawing, you might draw all these in black, and then you might draw all of these in red. Um, in my case right now, multi-frame is deciding what the colors are. And by the way, because I've given these sections, I can also give some dimension to things by rendering it. But we don't really need to worry about that right now. Okay, so I'm going to go here. And I'm going to draw. And by the way, you may notice, if you're alert, that I'm skipping over half of the directrices. And the reason is the following. If I connect that point to that point, these points do not produce a line in the same plane with that. So in other words, any member that I draw across here, say this one, 
from right there to right there. It is not touching that member right there. These two members are not intersecting, and therefore they cannot be um, counter-tensioning each other. So I'm not even bought, drawing that member there. So the frequency of the actual structural members is less than the frequency of the mathematical directrices. So those of you who are drawing by hand will continue this line across. You'll continue that line across. And then you'll do all the lines in the other direction. So I'm going to do some of those right now, just so you'll understand what we're doing here. So these cables, by the way, would be the gravity cables or the gravity members. What I just drew would be a wind member. And now I'm going to go skip a point here or a joint. Because remember, I want my gravity elements and my wind elements to intersect each other and counter tension each other. Now I'm going to use my usual trick of analyzing this, at which point it tells me some of these members have not been given a dimension, and so now I have them all as P2. Now, as I said, you're going to have to draw all these lines by hand if you're working in a hand-based program, um, but there are certain tricks that we can use in multi-frame, one of which is we can select all, and then I'm going to go to Geometry, and I'll pick uh, Rotate. And about Y, I'm going to rotate it by 45 degrees. So you can tell I've been through this. And now I can use certain symmetry arguments. Like I can go to uh, Plan View, and I can delete all of these. I hope I can do this without messing up too much. And now I'm going to take this, this much of that, and I'm going to mirror about Z. And then I'm going to take all of this, and I'm going to mirror about X. And then I'm going to go back to my 3D drawing. And now I have my hyperbolic paraboloid where I have the proper curved elements doing the structural work. So those original mathematical directrices were not structural elements. Now, that's one of the purposes of this exercise is to get that really embedded in your head that those straight elements do not work structurally. If you want the system to work, you have to generate these curved elements. And these curves, by the way, are the direction in which the grain was running in the original Catalano house. So, by the way, I have deleted all the original mathematical directrices. I didn't really intend to do that. Um, I was just going to select them all and, um, and then mask them out so that you could see this residual structure. Um, but somehow in this process, I went ahead and deleted them. 
those of you who are drawing on paper, of course, you can't delete those. So you might want to think about drawing your mathematical directrices in a light pencil and then doing these structural members in a heavier pen in some kind of strong color like red so that the structural part is most apparent. Think of those directrices as they're like construction lines for your drawing. They're not anything real that's actually going to exist there once you're done. So that concludes our video on doing a drawing of a hyperbolic paraboloid uh, starting with the mathematical directrices as our guides or construction lines for creating the curvilinear elements that are actually the structural elements in the final structure.